make some toast. Isn't there some bread around here? Hey, here it is. Hey, you know, I'm gonna have to do something about this plant. It's got bugs all over it. Oh, this bread is all moldy. Well, forget about the toast. Well, why don't you have a piece of fruit? Where do all these fruit flies come from? I don't know. Hey, look at this. This book's got a hole drilled right through it. But who would drill a book? Bookworm. Wormsy book. Actually, it's beetle lock. A baby insect, they ate books all right. This is unbelievable. Everywhere we turn, the plants, the fruit, this book, the bread, everything has something living off of it. You know, it's spooky. You know, it's like if you really listen closely, you can hear a lot of munching everywhere. <laughs> Three, two, one. Nature, when something is large, is usually very strong. In nature, when something is small, there's usually a lot more of them. Is that fair? Hey, you know, it's really amazing to think about. What's that? That everything around here is food for some creature. I mean, no matter where you look, there's some form of life going on. Mm -hmm. Who would have thought that this book is a good place for something to live in? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I can see where a stale piece of bread could support life. But did you know that there are some molds that actually live on plastic? They eat plastic? <laughs> right. I mean, I read that somewhere. I don't understand it either. And wow. what I don't understand is, how does everything know where to be? What do you mean? I mean, how does a bookworm know to be in a book? And how do those fruit flies know to be over there by the fruit? Oh, you mean, how do they know where the best place is for them to live? Yeah, I guess that's what I mean. Well, maybe it isn't that they know enough to find the right place. I mean, maybe it's that the ones that don't find the right place don't make it. It's like when I visited the salt marsh the other day. What's a salt marsh? It's at the edge of the sea, where the high tide brings salt water up onto the land for several hours a day. It's a very special place with very special conditions, just exactly right for all the life that's going on there. Uh, what? What's I'm the stuck? matter? Wait a second. <laughs> Why is it so muddy out here? Well, the mud is the soil of the salt marsh, and most of it forms from these, this grass here. When it dies, it decomposes and forms mud, and it's the soil of the marsh. Uh, and on this soil, all kinds of plants grow. In front of this is a mud flat covered with, with algae. Yeah. That's what all this green film is. There are a lot of shellfish, mainly, which feed on the green film. Well, I see mussels and stuff like that. Mussels and all... snails and uh, small crabs. One of the common crabs that you'll see is a fiddler crab. He's got one oh, big, look. large claw that looks like a fiddle, and that's ah! where he got his name. They use it a little bit in feeding, but it's mainly to scare each other with when the uh, want to keep an intruding crab out of a burrow, they wave this in their faces. Does it hurt? Do they bite really hard? No. These, these actually don't. You wouldn't do this with just any crab. Some crabs would crush your finger. This one doesn't. Oh, here's a worm. This is one of the sandworms that some people use for bait for catching fish. Uh, this worm is uh, related to the earthworm that you find in your gardens. It's got all these little appendages, little legs. They use those for swimming and also for burrowing in the mud. Oh, here, take it. <laughs> and in fact, this hole here may have belonged to the worm. Why are you making such a big deal over a worm? Well, he's not, he's not just a worm. He's a worm, but he's uh, food for some other larger animal. What animals? What larger eating? animals? Yeah. Sandpipers and small shorebirds feed on these worms. Oh, what's that? What is it? Can you see anything? Oh, fish! I get to say that. Will we scare them away or anything? I hope. Yeah, we'll, we'll scare wanna... them, but this collects almost everything that's on the bottom. Now, let's go on shore up here and bring the net back this way. 
so we make less noise? No, actually, a lot of noise is good. It gets them off the bottom. Okay, now I'll go across. Uh-huh. I go closer to shore, where it's deepest. Yeah. It's where the fish will be. Oh. A, a minnow. Do you do this every day? Every day. <laughs> Okay, let's bring it out here. <laughs> Do you think we caught any? Any? Oh, I think, think we managed to get some. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, quite a bit of things in there. Can you see? Sure. These are pretty big. Now, these are what that bird was diving for. That bird eats these. But actually, the th what eats these the most are larger fish than some of the buckets, so I can look <laughs> at them. Tickles. Okay, now the one oh. you the one you picked up. Notice you notice any difference between the one you have and the one I have? What else? I want to. We've seen fish and and, and I want to see clams. Clams. Okay. Sure, let's get some. But first, yeah. remember we have some fish in the bucket, and we have to let these go. Okay, we don't want to kill them. Is that okay? Yep. They're gone. See that? Watch the water squirt. Those are the, that's the water coming out of the siphon of the clams. Now, the clams here are small. Ooh. They're soft-shell clams. Here's the siphon that's squirting that water at us. Ooh. You can see it's rather long. Can we eat these kind of like the ones at the beach? Yes. Well, you want to eat some? Let's try it now. Oh, oh, I'll try. I don't know if I... Let's wash them off. Uh -huh. Can I have some here? There's three of them there. Can we really eat this out here? Yeah. I, I mean, because I, I know you, you, you can't go out to certain beaches and, and just dig them up and eat them because the water's no good. Uh, yeah, this water is probably not polluted. Uh, I can't get it off. Okay, here we go. Right. <laughs> okay, now wash them off. You might not think that that's washing it, but you want what you want to get off is the sand. Yeah. Which will scratch your teeth. Here we go. All right. I hope it doesn't make me sick. No, it won't make you sick. It's very good. No, that is good. Yeah, I can't believe all the different animals, all the different birds and fishes that we saw today. I mean, I, I thought there wasn't anything out there. Just dead grass and water. It's well, incredible. It, that's a salt marsh out there. It's a whole world within one community. Down here, we have some fresh water. And at a whole, an entirely different level, you can see another whole world. What kind of animals? If you took this fresh water under the microscope, you'd see a whole world of small microorganisms. Hard as it may be to believe, all of that life can fit inside a drop of water small enough to fit through the eye of that needle. Wow, that's how small they are? very much like a, a very busy freeway. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of action going on inside of the eye of a needle. It's like a little jungle in there. <laughs> what are these? That's a single-celled animal called a paramecium. Watch him twist. That's how he moves, by this twisting motion. Now that is not an animal, that is a volvox. It's a group of plants, and it lives through photosynthesis, the same as the plants in your garden. What are these long ones called? This is a nematode. It's a round worm, and actually eats bacteria, which are too small even to see through this microscope. These are rotifers. Watch them beat the water. It stirs up the food. Now he's about to snatch a piece of food as it comes by. There it is. Oh, he got it. Well, that one. <laughs> This animal is an amoeba. The amoeba moves in kind of a unique way. It moves with a rather flowing motion, very much like sand moving down an incline. Certainly a lot of things going on in just a little drop of water. Not only are there a lot of animals in there, the interesting thing is each one of those animals is food for yet another animal. Dr. Raywell, why did you become a scientist? I don't really know, but somewhere along in my education, I found out that I like to think. I, I like uh -huh. to do problems. I thought finding out about things that you can't really see, but you had to think about, that was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So it seemed to me that science was the area that I should go into, and chemistry was the science of all of the natural science that I liked the best. I was not a person who 
spent their time indoors reading constantly, you know, always having my uh, nose buried in a book. I did all of the kinds of things that, you know, everyone else does, stickball or those kinds. I don't know whether you can do stickball in New York any longer. But yeah, they're they're you bet. <laughs> Better believe so it, it seems like you're not the kind of person that spends your time home with your head buried in a book anymore either because you're Yeah, but now we call it work. See, we don't call it... Now you get paid When I was it. younger, we <laughs> called that playing. Now we call it work. <laughs> That's great. It's a great situation. It's enjoyable work. Well, what do you do, actually? Right now, I spend a, a large part of my time teaching and doing research. All of my research is based upon water and the, the chemicals that affect the things that live in water very much like the animals that live in pond water or fish that live in the, in the river. I see. Now exactly what is a food chain? A food chain is nothing but a bunch of steps in which larger animals keep on eating smaller animals. A middle-sized animal will eat all of the things, maybe plants and smaller animals, then it in turn will be eaten by a slightly larger animal. So if you have eight or nine of these steps, each one is like a link in the chain, and therefore you get the name food chain. Mm -hmm. Now, what would happen if one part of that food chain were to become extinct or die out or something like yeah. that? Yeah. Well, it depends on where in the food chain it happens. If it happens down in the beginning of the chain when there are very little animals, then it's possible some of the larger animals can find other small animals or plants to eat, and the chain just gets bent out of shape a little bit. If it happens at the very other end, where you're talking about a big animal, it may very well be that the next biggest animal can't find another food, and then the chain just stops, mm. and everything past that point dies because it has nothing to eat. Wow. Yeah. Well, mm. what would happen if, say, um, one of the smallest animals in a food chain, what would happen if they picked up on some kind of a toxic chemical, maybe in a stream or something like that? You mean like a poison? Yeah. What would happen then to the rest of the chain? All right, let's talk about DDT, which is used, we use DDT in farming, or we used to. The problem is little animals will take DDT into their bodies mm -hmm. so that the next size animal, when it eats the small animal, gets the animal plus DDT. And the more small animals that it eats, the more DT, DDT it gets. So each animal up the chain gets more DDT. Mm. So the very large animals get a lot of DDT. That's dangerous, isn't it? It could be fatal, and in, in some cases, it is fatal. Now, what if the large animals that are getting a lot of the DDT, or whatever the poison is, is an animal that people eat? Well, then, of course, the DDT is passed on to you. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to die because you're eating vegetables which have been exposed to DDT but it simply means that you are eating DDT, mm -hmm. and it, you really, that's not good. Well, then how do you know, then, how much DDT is no good for you, or how much of a poisonous thing is no good for you? It's very hard to say exactly, because you are, you are different than I am. What, the amount of DDT that it may take to make you ill might not be the same to make me ill or Mark. So therefore, it's very, very hard to say how much DDT is going to hurt somebody. That what, that's what makes it so difficult to use a chemical like DDT mm -hmm. and say it's safe because there are so many different things that come into it. Is that why they don't use it anymore? Yes, that's precisely the reason they don't use it. It is very poisonous and no one knows exactly how much is necessary to kill someone. So then we don't have to worry about DDT for the food that we eat, right? Because it's not being used. You do have to worry about DDT because there is still DDT in the water and on the grounds, even oh. though we are not using DDT any longer. What else might interfere with the food chain other than poisonous chemicals? Well, actually, poisons are only one of the things which may interfere. Man interferes when he takes away the food in, in terms of taking away the land that an animal would normally live on. They call the lion the king of the jungle, but perhaps it's the elephant, the largest land animal on Earth, who is the real king. Massive creatures weighing six tons can afford to be gentle. But with their huge bulk, elephants have to spend 16 hours a day eating 500 pounds of food and drinking at least 60 gallons of water just to stay alive. They also must have water to cool their enormous bodies. 
It takes a lot of land to produce that much food. So elephants survive by living in one area until the food runs low, then moving on. And they've been moving around this way for thousands of years. But today in Africa, the elephants have a big problem. People. The human population is growing and needing more and more food. More wilderness must be taken for farms and houses. More land for people means less land for all the animals. Some African animals, the smaller ones that need less food and less land, are surviving. But the elephant's size has become a terrible handicap. In their search for food, they will eat the grass, ripping out the roots and all. And without roots, the grass dies. Stripping all the bark off the trees is another sign that the elephants are becoming desperate. A completely stripped tree will die, and soon there will be nothing at all to eat. The elephants have destroyed their own source of food. The grass is gone, the soil is lifeless. As people struggle to meet their growing needs, they crowd the trapped elephants into smaller areas. Once the trees have died, the elephants must follow. The dying elephant's companion stays close by, watching helplessly as the vultures gather. She can do nothing. The elephant's world has been thrown completely out of balance. And unless something is done, the largest land animal on Earth could die out in many parts of Africa. You think with all of man's cleverness and superior brain and all that we could find a way to preserve the balance of nature and still take care of our own needs. Right. I mean, why should one species suffer just because another one is expanding and needs more room? Well, you know, there are other animals who don't need so much room and can live with man right under his very nose, as a matter of fact. Begin. Mighty insect or household pest. No matter which, they are found everywhere. Many ants live in the city, but even more live in the woods. Ants live in people's houses, under people's houses, in their own homes, or anthills. They all have their jobs to do. The queen does nothing but lay the eggs. Egg after egg, egg after egg, egg after egg. Other ants feed the babies, while other ants go outside and bring back food for everybody. Some of the ants do nothing but fix up the house. Still, others keep little bugs, like we keep cows, and milk them, more or less. Some keep them just as pets, like we keep dogs or cats. Some ants have wings, some don't. Some ants are really large, others so small you can hardly recognize them. But even though the ant is no bigger than this, the ant is capable of enormous feats of strength. By working together, they can carry off things many, many times their own size. You know, ants can accomplish tremendous feats because they work together. Well, it isn't only insects that work together. Other creatures do, too. Really? Sure. Bloodhounds work in gang. Whenever there's trouble, we'll sell the double with the Bloodhound Gang. If you've got the crime, we've got the time with the Bloodhound Gang. Hi, Ricardo. Grab a card, beautiful. I'm jogging. Come on, Vicky, it's a new trick. Grab a card. Now watch the great Ricardo. Six of diamonds, right? <laughs> Wrong. Jack of clubs, right? Wrong.
Bloodhound Detective Agency, whenever there's trouble with her on the double, Mr. Bloodhound isn't here. Yes. Yes. Eight o'clock. Right. Yeah, I knew I'd get it. Wrong. We've got to sit in on the reading of old Mr. Fowler's will. The bird man? Yeah, but his will smells fishy. Mm. What are you doing? Following you. I'm practicing shadowing criminals. Thanks a lot. Come on, kid. We're on a case. Bloodhound Detective Agency. Yes, I called. I'm Amanda Fowler. Come in. There's a new lawyer handling matters, and I don't trust him. He's due at any moment. I have a copy of the old will, but the lawyer says my uncle changed it. Something about passenger pigeon. What's a passenger pigeon? I'm sure I don't know. Look, here's one. American passenger pigeon, 1914. Gone, but not forgotten. All present? I believe I'm the only heir, Mr. Pettifog. We'll see. We'll see. Museum hours are over, children. They're friends of mine. Then, um, shall we all be seated? What do you think? A crook? Him? He steal the paint off your house. If you two will stop jabbering, I'll start the reading of the will. Yes, do. I, Aurelius Fowler, being of sound mind and judgment, revoke all earlier wills and codicils and declare this to be my last will and testament. First, Uh, to my niece and only living relative, Amantha Fowler of London, England, who does not share my scholarly interest in bird life, I leave the sum of uh, one dollar. Second, I give, leave, and bequeath the remainder of my estate to the Committee for the uh, <clears throat> Care and Preservation of the American Passenger Pigeon. Cough. Quick, slip out and call the Audubon Society. What's that? My they know all about birds. Find out if that committee is on the up and up. Private quarters provided for the staff. Finally, I appoint as the chairman of the committee and the executor of this will, my dear friend, attorney, and a fellow expert on birds, Hiram G. Pettifog. That's me. Hello? Is this the Audubon? I mean, Audubon Society? Well, this is Bloodhound Detective Agency, and I need some information on the Committee for the Care and Preservation for the American Passenger Pigeon. Yeah, it's important. I authorize my executor to sell, with or without notice, at either public or private sale. No such committee. He said there might have been before 1914. 1914? Good work, Cuff. Signed and sealed, etc., etc., and so forth and so on. I question the signature on that document. I should like to have it examined by a handwriting expert. A handwriting expert? Naturally, my dear Ms. Fowler. That won't be necessary. The will is a fake. Why? 
I'll stake my uh, <clears throat> reputation on it. What reputation? You don't know beans about birds. And that's exactly how you tripped yourself up. The clue is in the will and on that bird. The will cuts Ms. Amantha Fowler of London, England, out of her uncle's estate, right? Because she doesn't know much about birds. American birds, anyway. Precisely. The will also states that you are a bird expert. Exactly. Kindly read paragraph two again, Mr. Pettiford. The part about bequeath. I have no time for this nonsense. Read it, Mr. Pettiford. I give, leave, and bequeath the remainder of my estate to the uh, Committee for the Care and Preservation of the American Passenger Pigeon. Mr. Fowler was a famous bird man. He would never have agreed to that paragraph. You forged the will. How dare you make such a charge? Because Mr. Fowler knew, positively knew, all about the passenger pigeon. That's why he put gone but not forgotten on that bird. There used to be billions of those pigeons, thick as buffaloes, until they got wiped out. Care to read what this book has to say? Not one bird left alive. They've been extinct since 1914. Super! He's getting away. Don't worry, he won't get far. I've taken pictures of him, his car, and his license. The police will pick him up. We can file them under jailbird. Another case closed. Chalk another one up for the Bloodhound Gang. Yeah. Hey, what was that card you chose? King of Diamonds. Now watch the great Ricardo. <laughs> Presto. File that under amazing. Today we've discovered that no matter how big or small an animal is, it fits into its environment. Hey you guys, what are we going to do about the aphids growing on this plant? Well, I don't want to use chemicals. Hey, why don't we look for a ladybug? Right, yeah. they love aphids. Hey, and as for these fruit flies, we're just going to have to do without this apple. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do about your bookworm, Mark? Eh, I'm not sure. Hey, that's easy. Why don't we buy it a dictionary? Nah, too tough to get through. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, I gotta get it. Go. 321 Contact is a production of the Children's Television Workshop.